Hello and welcome to another episode of Knowledge Enthusiast Reacts or Comments on. Uh, this time with German Reunification Explained by History Scope. And uh, this is an, a, a topic that is uh, not particularly near to, to my knowledge, but um, it's, it's close to my heart because I um, I am myself uh, was born in the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, so you might know it as East Germany, um, in uh, Erzge im Erzgebirge, um, which is the southern part here of um, Saxony, right about here on the uh, Czech border. I was I was born in 1988, so two years. Um, before the uh, German un reunification and one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, although I have not much first-hand experience within the GDR and with the two systems, um, as you might expect my uh, family has and um, a lot of people I know have, because of the fact that we are originally um, from that area. And um, my father, for example, was born in 1959, so two years before the Berlin Wall was built, and uh, lived his whole life in the... In the uh, not his whole life, but um, until the reunification, lived in the GDR. Um, so I thought this would be um, a very interesting video. Uh, to me, I'm Ossi Isborn, I'm 31 years old. I'm, as I said, from East Germany, but I ra was raised um, and live now in Hamburg, Germany, which is in the West. Um, we moved there in 1992, so two years after the um, reunification. When I was um, around three and a half, uh, three and a half years old. Okay, cat, what do you want? No, not not there. Uh. So, um, because my keyboard is here, and I don't want the cat to run over the keyboard. No, 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 no. We don't want that to happen. Um, yeah. Uh. Let's uh, just start the video. Um, the link to the original video will be in the description. And um, if you like it, um, like and uh, subscribe. Not only to me, but um, also, of course, to the original um, creators. And uh, check out my other videos um, that you will find on my channel. But without further ado, let's start. German reunification almost didn't happen. It was opposed by nearly all world leaders. But there was one man who made it happen. One who convinced everybody. One man who vowed that Germany will be united. And this one man is uh, Helmut Kohl, which was the Chancellor of uh, West Germany from, I think, 1983 onwards. Um, he is still the longest reigning chancellor in uh, modern German history, if I remember correctly. He was in power for 16 years and he was in fact um, chancellor of uh, whole Germany for some time until I think it was 1999 or 2000 when um, Gerhard Schröder uh, came along. So, um, yeah, Helmut Kohl um, is seen in Germany as the Einheitskanzler, which means unity um, chancellor or unifying chancellor, because it is um, more or less um, his work, like, like Otto von Bismarck um, unified Germany in 1871 and um, is more or less uh, credited for it all alone even though others were uh, involved as well uh, as well and uh, the same goes for Helmut Kohl um, who is more or less solely um, credited for the German uh, reunification on German part of things um, the Allies did 
um, play a huge role as well, of course. After the Second World War, Germany was split into several regions. What is often overlooked is that Germany was not separated into four regions, but seven. The four you probably heard about are these four occupation zones. This part was under British control. This part is um, Schleswig-Holstein, a huge uh, portion of modern Niedersachsen. In fact, some of these parts which were in the GDR belong now to Niedersachsen, um, including Bremen and uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. Then you have um, Rhineland-Palatine and the former um, the former state of I think it's Württemberg only Württemberg um, they were actually Baden, which is Baden-Württemberg today where it was um, several um, states at that point uh, which were French then you have the Saar protectorate which will go on to become more or less uh, its own country until the people vote to be reunified with Germany in 1955 and will be reunified with Germany in 1957, which is viewed as the small reunification. Uh, then you have Bavaria and Hesse, which um, belonged and um, Baden, um, the Baden part of Baden-Württemberg, um, which belonged to the um, US. And then you have uh, modern Saxony, modern Thuringia, uh, modern Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, modern Brandenburg, and of course East Berlin, um, and Saxon um, Anhalt, Saxony Anhalt, which belonged to the Soviets or the Soviet occupation zone. Then you have Kaliningrad here, um, which was an uh, Eastern, Eastern Prussian. Um, city, uh, a very powerful Eastern Prussian city and a very, very st strategic location, which is one of the reasons why the Russians um, did not only occupy it, but integrated into Russia. Um, and it is still Russia today and it's a very important Baltic Sea harbor for uh, the Russians. Then you have the rest of Eastern Prussia, which um, will go on to be part of Poland, but um it will only be um uh, much later that the um treaty of warsaw is it i think um will settle the, that this part will belong to poland and germany uh eastern germany and western germany won't um claim it back uh, which was also a huge part in the treaties that made the reunification happen but, but i i won't um, uh, talk too much about that now then you have um, uh, eastern pomerania and i don't know right now what these parts are called which uh, will also go to poland probably heard about are these four occupation zones this part was under british control this part under soviet control this part under u.s control and this part under French control. Berlin was similarly divided amongst these four powers. But there are three more regions. The first is this small area which became the Saar Protectorate, whose people decided to rejoin West Germany in the 1950s. Then there is this part, which today we call Kaliningrad Oblast. It became part of the Soviet Union. And uh, Kaliningrad previously was known as Königsberg, or in English, um, King's Mountain, if you translate it directly. Um, and Kaliningrad is more or less the Russian version of um, that name. Likewise, um, Danzig, which is around here uh, and belongs now to Poland, is called in, in Polish Gdansk. It's this part, which today we call Kaliningrad Oblast. It became part of the Soviet Union and wasn't just a country occupied by foreign powers like the rest of Germany. This land was now Russian, these people were now Russians, and their official language was now Russian. And lastly, this vast area was given to Poland, meaning these Germans were now living in Poland. Over time, the British, French and US zones would become West Germany and the Soviet zone would become East Germany. 
Because the capitalist West and communist East were on opposite sides of a cold war, the two stayed separate countries. There wasn't really any hope that Germany will be united. Um, even though there was not, not that much hope for a reunification, it um, both countries actually um, did claim the territory of the other country. So West Germany still claimed East Germany and um, in the Article 23 of the uh, Grundgesetz, which is the um, German um, constitution in the version of 1949 when it was uh, written, um, does not name it, but um, it, it, it states that uh, this constitution would also apply for future territories that would be part of Germany in reference to the Saar Protectorate and to East Germany, uh, which is why this part um, was um, changed uh, in 1990. It was um, just um, deleted in, in 1990 after reunification and is now the um, European um, article. Um, and on the other side, East Germany um, claimed the territory of West Germany um so both both germany like like in korea both germany's um would want a reunification but under their system and their rule um and um this is one of the reasons why there was not much hope for a long time um, especially in these early phases because what the GDR wanted was more or less that was uh, what the Soviet Union wanted and the Soviet Union um, did want uh, none of this and uh, so um, and even if they wanted something they would want uh, West Germany and they don't want um, East Germany to become part of West Germany because uh, that would mean no capitalism there. State separate countries. There wasn't really any hope that... Oh, and um, like in, in my passport, I um, it says I am German and I'm born in Germany because West Germany never um, accepted East Germany as, a, in, as an independent state um and would not uh, will not recognize it today as such so um in in the bureaucracy of west germany east germany didn't even um exist at least not as a state even though they had diplomatic ties and stuff like that um uh, but like i said uh I, if I want to say that I was born in East Germany or I, I want to to be recognized as a citizen of East Germany, um, that that won't happen because um, yeah there in regards to to West Germany there is no East Germany. It, it is all Germany and it was always all Germany. A cold war the two stayed separate countries. There wasn't really any hope that Germany will be united. Over time, a wall was built between the two Germanys to make sure that people from the poorer East could not emigrate to the richer West. Um, the wall, the famous Berlin Wall was built, you guessed it, in Berlin, um, because this was a high concentration of people um, with a direct um, confrontation zone. Um, there was no real wall all across these parts of um, the state. Um, but in Berlin you had the wall, you had the death zone, you had 24-7 uh, surveillance, um, stuff like that. <clears throat> and some of this you also had at all, the, the whole border um, to West Germany. Um, but in, in that cases it were um, in mostly fences um, with guards um, patrolling and stuff. The um, husband of my mother is um, actually was actually arrested uh, in his youth for the attempt of uh, fleeing East Germany and um, had to go to the border to um, 
recreate his attempt so they could uh, take a picture and put it in his files which um, he now has and uh, where I have seen the picture and um, uh, he used the uh, tree um, branch which was hanging over the border to to get over the fence um, in some parts the defenses were even higher you don't uh, only had one fence you maybe had two fences you had uh, patrolling houses you had lights and stuff and in some parts it was looser um, where you had maybe terrain that uh, you couldn't pass that easily but um, there, there was surveillance there as well so if you wanted to maybe swim over a river you would still be uh, most likely um, be, be discovered. In the 1980s, the economic and social differences between the West and the East were becoming apparent. Soon, peaceful protests broke out throughout the Communist East, including West Germany. Then, on the Which evening of November 9th, 1989, the East German press secretary made a mistake that would change history. Uh, eine Regelung zu treffen, die es jedem Bürger der DDR möglich macht, über Grenzübergangspunkte der DDR auszureisen. But he was wrong. In actuality, people could now apply to travel abroad in a few months. Um, actually, the press conference um, went with what what um, Günter Schabowski, the press secretary of um, East Germany, said in in that clip was um, that the uh, government of the GDR just had um, uh, made it possible for citizens of the GDR to leave the country to visit um, Western Germany or um, other countries, um, especially West Berlin. And um, that part is, is the true part. That is what the government decided. Um, the crucial part that went down in history, especially in German history, and what led to the fall of the Berlin Wall is what he said after that. Because um, a press, um, a press rep representative um, asked him, when will this take effect? And then Schabowski um, looked at his, his papers and... and, and and didn't found anything and said um, as far as I know this is in effect immediately so right now and that was the the huge mistake because um, when the people especially in, in uh, West Berlin but in all parts of, of the GDR saw this they took this word took this word for granted and they immediately um, went to to the borders to the wall teared down the wall but in other parts like um my my father was um, working at that time and he was preparing meals and he was in a higher position in in his factory and uh, so naturally his his employees did not trust him and while he was preparing the meals in the night shift um these these in uh, these press conference was made and immediately um, everyone left and when he was finished no one told him and, and he had no radio or something in the kitchen and when he was finished um, preparing the meals he, he went to the to the dining hall and, and no one was there and then he went around the factory and no one was there um, not even my mother who who um, immediately um, drove to Hof in Bavaria which is near the um, border of, of uh, Saxony and uh, did not even inform my father. So uh, not to stay there, but just to, to be there, to shop, to go shopping and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and to, to experience the, the new freedom they had. And um, in, in, in uh, Berlin, the guards actually had um, strict orders to to gun down everyone who uh, wants to to pass um, it, it 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 was also not like that they could apply and it would only take effect in a few months um, as far as i know it, it sh 
should take effect the next day with devices, not in a few months. Um, but due to the the uh, misunderstanding and the fact that Chabowski had no information on when exactly this would take effect and his, him saying that it would be immediately um, led to, to the people show up in droves um, on both sides actually and uh, the guards just ignored their orders because what, they, they couldn't gun down a whole city there were only a few guards at, at uh, the checkpoints and um yeah that 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 wouldn't have end well um beforehand there were um actually a lot of um friendly uh, peaceful um protests with the famous slogan wir sind das volk we are the people and um so the the decline and the mindset of the people was pretty much set at that point so it was only a question of time which is again why the politburo actually decided to um, loosen the restrictions which then led to opening the actual wall um i will put um no you don't want you you, you wouldn't understand it either uh, i just i was just thinking about putting the actual um full clip with the question of the press representative but uh, maybe if I find an English uh, dub, uh, uh, sub version, I will uh, put it here. Mir ist hier also mitgeteilt worden, dass eine solche Mitteilung heute schon äh, verbreitet worden ist. Sie müsste eigentlich in Ihrem Besitz sein. Also Privatreisen nach dem Ausland können ohne Vorliegen von Voraussetzungen, Reiseanlässe und Verwandtschaftsverhältnisse beantragt werden. Die Genehmigungen werden kurzfristig erteilt. Zuständige Abteilung Pass- und Meldewesen der VP der Volkspolizei Kreisämter in der DDR sind angewiesen, Visa zur ständigen Ausreise unverzüglich zu erteilen, ohne dass dafür noch geltende Voraussetzungen für eine ständige Ausreise vorliegen müssen. Äh, ständige Ausreisen können über alle Grenzübergangsstellen der DDR zur BRD erfolgen. Damit entfällt die vorübergehende ermöglichte Erteilung von entsprechenden Genehmigungen in Auslandsvertretungen der DDR bzw. die ständige Ausreise mit dem Personalausweis der DDR über Drittstaaten. Äh, die Passfrage kann ich jetzt nicht beantworten. Das ist auch eine technische Frage. Ich weiß ja nicht, die Testpässe müssen ja, also damit jeder im Besitz eines Passes überhaupt erstmal ausgegeben werden. Wir wollten aber Entscheiden sicherlich Ihnen, inhaltlich aus. Ja. Ist die, wann tritt das, das tritt nach meiner Kenntnis, ist das sofort. Unverzüglich. Wie die Presseabteilung des Ministeriums hat der Ministerrat beschlossen, dass bis zum Inkrafttreten einer entsprechenden gesetzlichen Regelungen durch die Volkskammer diese Übergangsregelung in Kraft gesetzt wird. Also doch, doch, ständige Ausländer können über alle Grenzübergangsstellen der DDR zur BRD bzw. zu Berlin-West erfolgen. Um, but anyway, let's continue. It was wrong. In actuality, people could now apply to travel abroad in a few months, not right away. But the words were said, the people had heard, no, 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 and thousands flocked to the border crossings. Because the press secretary misspoke, people thought that the gate was open immediately. The bewildered border guards didn't know what to do with the tens of thousands wanting to get through. And so, without being given orders to do so, the border guards opened the gates and let the East German masses through. Like, look at that, how many guards you see, it's like maybe five, six, seven, most... <laughs> A maximum of 10 at that and and how many people there are sure the guards are armed the people aren't but um they even there, there were guards who um considered the option to um uh strictly follow their orders there are um uh, also clips of uh, Berliners on other checkpoints who actually were repelled um, where the guards said no 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 we don't let you through here and crying uh, I remember there was a crying woman who was so happy to be able to to cross uh, the border and then she stands there and she can't and, and she's repelled and um, but yeah um, in, the, in the course of the night this um, this will grow so much that on almost every checkpoint the people were 
um, let through. And I think the woman was later on um, uh, let through that uh, border, guided by by a guard. Um, if I find the clip, I will also include it here. And um, yeah, do so. The border guards opened the gates and let the East German masses through. And then came David Hasselhoff and was looking for freedom. Look, look, look how he confused he is. And so the Berlin Wall fell. The division was over and the people were liberated. To the world this signified the end of the Cold War. To Germany a call for reunification. Yeah. Um, this is something we have to be clear on. The f fall of the Berlin Wall was was not the moment when Germany reunified. It was just um, from from that moment on, Germans Germans were um, actually be able to travel again between the the two countries, um, which they were actually able to do before the uh, building of the Berlin Wall and the uh, defenses on the uh, other borders um, as well, which is one of the reasons why the war was built, because some decided to stay in the West and um, those were especially the higher educated ones. Um, so the GDR lost a lot of productive um, people. And um, it is also, um, I, I, I also have to stress that not everyone in the GDR felt oppressed. Um, the, the most tensions um, arose in Berlin because uh, Berlin again was a, a center of population um, and they had direct contact to the West. They, they just saw um, over the wall and could see how, how good the West is, um, so to speak. In other parts of Germany, um, of, of East Germany, um, where people did not have that much contact and where, like, like to, you have today, you have people who never leave their hometown in their whole life. So to those, it's, it's meh, I don't care. And you even have people who uh, actually enjoyed living in the GDR because they had a job and most of the basic things were um, cheap. Like my father once said, um, a beer cost around 10 pfennig, which is five cent today. Um, inflation uh, adjusted, it might be a little bit more, but it was very, very cheap. Sure, you you had some, you, you didn't have some things like um, yellow bananas. They were actually bananas. Um, I, I don't know if, if you know about this, but in Germany, there is these stereotypes that the people in East, um, East Germany did not have bananas. Um, which is only partly true because they had bananas, but um, those were not the yellow ones uh, you find everywhere in the supermarket because um, they, the bananas in East Germany, if I remember correctly, were still green. So they were not fully grown. Um, like um, again, my father, for example, um, did really enjoy living in a GDR, and um, there are some some people even today who um, call for um, a, a div division of Germany again to split east and west, um, because even though there were multiple um, uh, attempts made to um, even out the differences between east and west. Um, even today, there is still a huge, huge, huge division. And the people who live in the East um, feel not as good as those who live in the West because the, the paychecks are um, smaller there. So, like, you know, um, the, the, it's actually a misconception, but for the sake of argument, that uh, men would uh, get paid more than women. And Eastern men even get paid less than Western women. And uh, Eastern women, uh, when it comes down to all this, will uh, in um, will actually be paid around half what the Western man is paid. Um, 
on average. Um, and this is a huge difference. Also, the uh, due to all these uh, people who did not want to live in East Germany anymore going to West Germany, um, there is also a, a lack of people there and the lack of um, a lack of uh, fa factories, a lack of infrastructure, and so on and so on and so on. And this division and th this this um, landslide of, of differences is still um, still be seen today. Um, so there are actual people who say we had it better when we lived in uh, in the east. Um, but as always, those who were the loudest were those um, who cried for for opening the wall, cried for uh, called for unification, and especially in in West Germany, um, the mindset was a whole different because the people thought of themselves as the better people. Um, a little bit like like in northern and southern states in the U.S. Um, the Western Germans thought of themselves as as those who saved those East Germans, who who uh, and, and these East Germans all were and everything was bad and they didn't have anything in East Germany and stuff like that. I even myself uh, once made a presentation in in uh, school, and um, we all should um, uh, were tasked to do a presentation on a country. And I choose my own home country, which I, uh, uh, I actually identified with at that point. I was around 12 years old and made a, a presentation about the GDR. And I did this presentation with the help of my father, who, as I already said, um, was already... Yeah, he, he's seen the good sides of, of the GDR. And when I then held this presentation, my teacher would actually go on and, and, and uh, accuse me of lying um, because I, I said positive things and there were no positive things in the GDR and um, I can't be right. And I explained to her, this is I, I come from that place. My father helped me do this. I uh, This is first-hand experience. And she's like, no, no, no. The GDR was bad, and uh, uh, there was nothing positive about it. And uh, I actually got a got a, a bad um, um, grade. So, uh, and and that was the mindset of of many 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 um, West Germans, which is still in the minds today. Even though I was um, born only in in, uh, in 1988, which is two years before reunification, which is like I was a baby when all that happened. Uh, for all I know, I grew up in, in, in whole Germany, in West Germany, even because I grew up in Hamburg. But even in school, um, by other childs who, again, have no experience with uh, the GDR, but um, have the experience passed down from their parents and from, from history lessons and stuff like that. Um, were um, at some point bullying me for being from, from East Germany. Um, and there are a lot of East Germans who were bullied. My name, Ossi Isborn, is, is a nickname I gave to myself in defense of that because I was always called Ossi because that's the German term for people from um, Eastern Germany is Ossi, which means Easterly. <laughs> um, Whereas the Western uh, people were called Vesi, from Western. And um, they all called me Ossi, but they did not call me Ossi because it was a nice name. They called me in uh, with, a, with, a, with a bad connotation, you, you know what I mean. Um, because they thought that being an Aussie is something bad. And on top of that, I'm even from Saxony, which is called the Valley of the Not Knowing, or, or in German, is Tal der Anuslosen, which refers to the part around Dresden, where at some point um, Western television could not be um, uh, seen on, on the televisions, which um, led to them not be able to, to view the first and second program from the West, which everyone else um, was viewing and getting their real information, because, of course, in the GDR, the, um, the state television would censor things. Um, 
yeah so the the uh it, it was not all bad in in eastern germany and not everyone cried called for for unification it signified the end of only the those who were the loudest to germany a call for reunification germany will be united upon hearing this news the west german parliament began singing the german national anthem But one person was notably missing. One person who would change Germany forever. One person who would see to it that Germany will be united. Chancellor Helmut Kohl, the leader of West Germany. Hel sort of. Um, actually, the German um, government is a bit more complicated than that because de facto um, the leader of the country is the uh, Bundespräsident, um, president, um, but it's only a representative, uh, representative um, position. Um, you can compare that to the Queen of England or the Queen of Great Britain. And um, then you have the uh, Bundeskanzler or the uh, Chancellor. And you have the Bundestagspräsident, so the president of the Bundestag. You might compare it to, to in, in the US, you have the Senate and you have the, um, the other thingy. And in Germany we have something similar. We have the Bundestag, which is uh, representatives of all of Germany. And uh, then we have the Bundesrat. Um, which is um, representative uh, representatives of the um, federal states and then we have the uh, ministers which are the uh, cabinet and um, the head of these ministers is Helmut Kohl but Helmut Kohl um, was Helmut Kohl at that point now it's Angela Merkel um, but the chancellor is not able to like make laws. That's only the parliament, um, which again is uh, had their head in the Bundestag's president or the president of the Bundestag. And uh, so he's the the chancellor is is not really the head of state, not not really the most powerful person in state, if you want so. Um, but he's one of the three most powerful. It's it's debatable who one has the most power because in the end everything the uh, go government does can be cancelled by the president. He has to sign it and if he don't sign it, it won't happen. Chancellor Helmut Kohl, the leader of West Germany. Helmut Kohl was in Poland at the time, celebrating the first freely elected Polish government since World War II. Kohl was surprisingly quiet when he heard the news that the wall was open. He asked himself, what should I do now? This was a historic moment. If Germany was ever to become one country, it would need to be right now. So he rushed back to Germany and began writing a plan for German reunification. This plan was made in absolute secrecy. Nobody, not even his own government, knew what was going on except Kohl and those closest to him. In fact, he had only sent the speech to other world leaders an hour before he made it. And he only sent it in German, so they wouldn't be able to read this speech and stop him before he made it. And so on November 28th, a mere two and a half weeks after the wall fell, Kohl made his announcement. The way to Deutschland, Einheit, das wissen wir alle, is not from grünen Tisch zu planen, oder is auch nicht zu planen mit einem Terminkalender in der Hand. Und abstrakte Modelle, kann man vielleicht polemisch verwenden, aber sie helfen nicht weiter. Aber wir können, wenn wir nur wollen, uns schon heute auf jene Etappen vorbereiten, die zu diesem Ziel hinführen. Germany will be united. This speech was very popular in West Germany, but caused major anxieties in the rest of the world leaders. You see, the British, French, United States and Soviet Union still had troops on German soil. And they had so-called reserved rights, meaning these four countries had to allow German reunification. Um, one of the reasons for this is um, you have to imagine th the Allies and Germany at this point were 
officially still at war. There were no peace treaty. Um, the um, especially the the Western allies um, did allow Germany to become a country. Did allow uh, Germany to be independent. Um, but um, as you just said, they had um, particular rights. So Germany was not fully independent. This would only uh, happen with a peace treaty or a similar document, which was the um, Treaty of the Question of Germany, or uh, what is this called? Um, or in short, the 2 plus 4 um, contract or the tre treaty, um, or in German 2 plus 4 Vertrag. Um, which not only um, uh, is seen as the final peace treaty, um, but also will um, be the point um, at, at from that point on, the Allies have no um, jurisdiction over Germany anymore. Um, Germany from that point on is not only unified, but is um, independent in in everything um they don't have to 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 ask to to do something um and also the border of uh, germany um, especially the oder nice linie um will be cemented with this contract because west germany did at first not accept this new border um but then they kind of did but um they they left some kind of loophole um which which was seen as in case of reunifications they could claim those territories back so with the contract um with the treaty they had to uh, once and for all accept the oder neisse border um, which is still the eastern border of um, germany today uh yeah of the rights meaning these four countries had to allow German reunification and all four powers were basically having none of it. A unified Germany is a powerful Germany and a powerful Germany had been their enemy in two world wars. Not only in two world wars but uh, also the unification wars and uh, some smaller skirmishes in between like um, actual Teddy Roosevelt once um, prevented the first world war to um, start like a decade before it actually did because there were some dispute between germany and uh, i don't know if, if it was the french or the british um which could have meant war and always uh, almost went to war but uh, then teddy roosevelt came along and settled it um and prevented yeah the war uh, I will put more um, information on that in the info text box. And a powerful Germany had been their enemy in two world wars. But Helmut Kohl was not deterred. And you have to imagine, um, you, throughout history, um, uh, the, what, what is Germany today was always a huge, huge, huge power and um, even when it was divided in like 300 territories um, everyone in the world had their fair share of respect for those german territories and some of those territories would become leaders of of uh, countries like spain and great britain and um, so when the german unification in 1871 happened this again well for the first time was uh, uh, the a real threat that couldn't get realer um, because all these smaller powers within germany who are already powerful especially prussia which was one of the uh, five most powerful um nations if you say one so uh, in in europe and um actually by a treaty which uh, defined the um, so-called con concert of europe which was um, prussia austria great britain france and um, russia uh, which made the balance of power um, and now these these strong regions would become one country and 
history tells us tells us what would become of these one country these one unified strong power which you need a whole world to defeat in two world wars only 20 years uh, apart from each other so germany did not only recover after the first world war they were able to again rage war on on the whole world um with at four major superpowers needed to defeat them and uh so in 1990 it's it's only natural if if these countries were like okay we had a weekend somewhat weekend um germany to, uh, now or we had two weekend germanys which were despite being weakened um, economic powerhouses for their um, respective reasons so the the gdr was was not that poor compared to um, other regions in the soviet union and and now we have again two powerful nations who would become one single extremely powerful nations almost um, as powerful as a super might um and they germany at one point was a super might um or superpower if uh, you say this, i think um and they wanted to to uh, so with, with, with this in mind it is only understandable that um the allies were against um the idea of unification and at first the uh, politburo in the gdr um, led by erich Hönecker also was against unification because um, from his perspective he would lose his power he would lose all that he had um, re reached and fought for the last um, years i mean he was like 20 years or, or, or somewhat like that he was the leader of um, the gdr their enemy in two world wars but helmut kohl was not deterred germany will be united so first up, Helmut Kohl had to convince East Germany to even want to join the West. Well, this was an easy task. Reunification was seen as an escape from poverty, and during the East German elections, the first and only free elections in East Germany, Kohl campaigned for pro-reunification parties. And they won. Yeah, so that's, that's what I just said. Um, the Politburo, so the SED, which was the... Um, the governing party for since the start of the gdr in in 49 um was more or less against it the people most of the people were um were were positive uh, in regards to the uh, unification and there were parties that were positive towards the reunification um but especially those who already had the power were reluctant, uh, had to be convinced, and those who weren't convinced um, would become convinced uh, with these elections. Germany Kohl campaigned for pro-reunification parties, and they won. So that's one down. Now it's time to convince the rest of the world, because Germany will be united. Next up was France, led by François Mitterrand. Germany was founded on the defeat of France, and historically the two had been rivals for control of Europe. A unified Germany would be economically, industrially and politically superior to France. Which at that point West Germany already more or less was. Um, I, I don't have the um, actual numbers, but I think West Germany was at least very close to the um, economic capaci capacity of um, France. And with the, what was it, like 9 to 20 million um, East Germans joining, um, they feared what actually happened now, that uh, Germany would not only overtake them, but be ways ahead ways 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 ahead and this again would mean um a great um danger for for france um, as you see here this is the uh, kaiser krönung of uh, versailles so the the emperor crowning of versailles after the unification wars when um the german um, emperor 
um, actually uh, reigned uh, over over a territory that would include um, Paris at that point because they won against France in the war then they occupied this part of uh, France and they went to Versailles in the um, Hall of Mirrors and uh, crowned him emperor and um, this always has been seen as uh, as yeah very uh, I, I always forget the 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 word um, in, in German it's Demütigung um, but give me a second I of course will look it up um, uh, humiliation uh, yes yes that that's the word humiliation and um, also Germany and France for centuries fought over specific parts um, in the bordering region um, most importantly the Saar region um, which is one of the reasons why France uh, wanted them to be uh, become their own state and Elsa Lothringen uh, or Elsa uh, Lothrain which is the region where you found Strasbourg in which at one point was German and at some other point was uh, France and actually now is French and um, which is a region with um, um, a pretty much German culture and the people in these uh, in this region um, at least some of them um, actually speak German, especially right on the border. But even uh, when you go inland, I had a working colleague from that region who was fluent in German and in French and um, lived way inland um, because the uh, Elsass Lothringen was uh, for a long time um, German or mostly German. And uh, But it is, is a rich uh, region and uh, that's why both um, countries want to to have it and also it's a strategic region would be economically industrially and politically superior to france but mitterrand was crafting his own plan germany really wanted reunification he realized that by having this new powerful germany at their side with the rest of europe at their back it would have a big role to play in world affairs. So Mitterrand demanded a bigger role for the European Union. A single European army, a single European foreign policy, and a single European currency. And um, as we know today, this is what the European Union uh, more or less has become. And the German-French um, friendship, especially um, when they're working together in the European Union, is um, seen as as one of the most powerful alliances um, in the world um, economically at least and um, both countries are seen as more or less the leaders of the european union with germany um, on top of it because germany has the most people has the best economy and um, as well as the the best diplomatic um, uh, relations um, but yeah Imagine um, the the unification could have uh, couldn't have happened if uh, the the French president would have seen Germany still as a potential enemy. So um, luckily for um, Germany, um, he didn't, and he saw it, uh, saw the positive uh, um, effects this uh, unification could have on uh, even for France and um, went with it. So um, we, we can thank Mitterrand uh, for the unification as well. And we can see the results of this today. Germany and France are the main deciding powers in the EU. The Euro gave France a strong currency, and with the UK leaving the EU, the European army is finally becoming a realization. But this was exactly what the British did not want. <laughs> The British Prime Minister, Margaret mm, Thatcher, funny. lived through the Nazi air raids and she herself saved money for a Jewish girl to stay with her family for sanctuary. She feared Germany would dominate Europe and the UK over time. If we did not retain our national identities in Europe, 
the dominant people in Europe would be German. Yeah. The way Which, I mean, kind of true because the dominant um, country in the European Union, at least, is as I just said, Germany, um, due to the to the factors, not militarily. Um, because um, there is no 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 need um, anymore for military um, conflicts, and by um, tying the uh, economies together, um, the the chances of um, such conflict breaking out again is is very little. Because, like, if we say Germany would attack France again, um, then Germany would shoot an own goal because. Um, with all the trade, with all the resources and uh, import and export in and out of France, um, th this would cripple the, the German economy um, as well if uh, they attack any other country in the European Union or even in the world maybe. Because like if you attack China, uh, uh, most of the stuff we use came, comes from China. If you attack Russia, um, a lot of oil and gas in Europe comes from Russia. If you attack the US, no. And um, But you see here the, the completely different mindset from Margaret Thatcher. While uh, Mitterrand sees, sees Germany, Germany as a potential strong ally and, and the chance for France to, to, to rise to more power, Margaret Thatcher sees, uh, still sees the enemy in Germany, the potential enemy. And um, I, I actually don't know what uh, would convince her to, to actually give in to the demand of a unified um, Germany. Um, because we just heard the speech and uh, we know uh, with hindsight 2020 that Germany is unified now. Uh, so let's see, because I don't know. The dominant people in Europe would be German. Yeah. The way but by this time, the United Kingdom was no longer the superpower it was before the Second World War. And by Thatcher's own admission, the UK had become the least important of the four powers and would eventually bow down to the will of the other three. Well, at least France was now persuaded. If Helmut Kohl could get the other three powers to agree, maybe that was enough and he wouldn't need Britain's approval. It was time for Kohl to move on to the next power, the United States of America, led by President George Bush. Unlike the other three powers, the USA didn't really fear a powerful Germany. After all, Europe was an ocean away and wouldn't be able to cause too much trouble for America. This would, in fact, take a piece of territory away from the USSR and would put distance between their European allies and Soviet troops. And it would put NATO troops slightly closer to the Russian heartland. So we have Mitterrand who sees the positive side and, and is, uh, let, let's go for it. He is convinced. Then you have Margaret Thatcher, who sees Germany as a potential enemy and sees only the negative aspects of, of a Euro uh, reunification. Now you have the US, who is like indifferent because we don't care, um, but with with the slight swift to the positive effects, like you just said, um, one communist country um, less and um, you can put the troops more east, which actually did not come true because one uh, point of the two plus four contract is that there would be no, um, at least no atomic weapons in East Germany. Never, ever, 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 ever. Because Germany itself has no um, atomic weapons, but there are some atomic weapons um, stationed in Germany because Cold War and um which is kind of scary that you have atomic weapons you have no control over you need like uh, i think it was two um us uh, officers and one german officer to launch those but eh, it's 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 kind of scary nonetheless and i think the um the power of troops that can be stationed in East Germany is also limited by the contract, but I'm not sure. I know it's it's an absolute um, atomic weapon free zone, um, one of one of only few. Uh, yeah. 
So yeah, we have uh, positive, we have negative. Now we have somewhat indifferent leaning to positive. Um, let's see, what will the Russians be? Will the Russians be also indifferent but leaning towards um, towards the negative aspects or will they be negative or whatsoever uh, altogether? Or will they be even positive because they have their own struggles to deal with? And it will put NATO troops slightly closer to the Russian heartland. So, yay, that's two powers convinced. It really started to look like Germany will be united. But now came the Soviet Union, Gorbachev. led by Secretary General Mikhail Gorbachev. His would be a tough one. East Germany was seen as part of the Soviet Empire. Gorbachev would not simply hand over a client state to their rivals. Not only did the Soviets fear a powerful Germany, it also feared British, French and US troops moving into East Germany, coming ever closer to Moscow. So the argument for um, George Bush, um, on the positive note, is the same argument Gorbachev uses on the negative side, um, which is understandable because um, Russia still, um, and even today, fears an invasion of the West um, because, let's be honest, um, if you invade any country throughout history, the Russians were involved at some point and the Russians, uh, Russians were, were invaded. Uh, some, sometimes they repel the invasion, sometimes uh, they don't, like when the Mongols came around, um, like when the Polish came around, the Lithuanians came around, the Swedish came around. Um, even the Germans in World War I they couldn't repel and um, only got their territories back because Germany lost the war uh, in the West. And in World War II, Germany came a huge portion of the um, industrial and population heartland of, of Russia. Um, that's one of the reasons why Russia is, is so eager to um, avoid being invaded today and so aggressive in, in its in its uh, foreign policies and um, yeah um, they they one point is they fear that Germany at some point could invade again a third time um, at least a third time since uh, since the unification and they fear that the NATO, could also um, invade Russia and, and destabilize maybe things or take other satellite states. Um, so it will take a lot of convincing for, for uh, Gorbachev at, um, as well. And I, uh, I know that one of the crucial points was the atomic weapon free zone and um, that the borders would be accepted, the Odenaise Linie. It is at this point that we have to look at the rest of Europe particularly Eastern Europe. Because while Eastern Germany was protesting, the rest of the USSR's client states were in similar stages of revolution. Within two years, the Soviet Union itself would collapse. Gorbachev was acutely aware of the state of his country and needed money to push through economic reforms he hoped would modernize the Soviet Union and, hopefully, keep his country together. East Germany was broke and it was kept afloat by continuous money supplies from the USSR. So what if he could sell it to West Germany? He would lose this large expense, gain some much needed income, and could gain this new powerful Germany as an important ally in European politics. I did not know of that. But there were some conditions. First, no NATO bases in East Germany, and the Russian withdrawal was not allowed to be presented as a retreat. NATO agreed. And so, West Germany sent a delegation to Moscow to discuss Germany giving loans to the Soviet Union in exchange for German reunification. He did it. Three of the four powers had agreed. The UK would soon join the other three, and Germany will be united. But now came one very important question. What territory does German reunification include? You see, Large portions of land had been given to Poland and the Soviet Union after World War II. Helmut Kohl wanted all these lands returned. Um, mm, like I said earlier, um, West Germany at, at some point did accept the... Um, I, I think it, it's the Treaty of um, Warsaw. 
And uh, in that treaty, the Oder Neisse Linie was um, put into effect as a border, but they left um, they left a loophole and did um, not particularly rule out that um, in case of reunification, they wouldn't claim back those territories. Um, but as far as I am aware, and I might be wrong, and in that case, I would learn something entirely new, something extremely interesting, um, but as far as I know, um, Helmut Kohl um, did not really or openly um, demand those regions uh, back for West Germany. There might be um, some political powers inside West Germany and even inside East Germany who um, claim those territories who were historically German um, back but um there was the the german polish uh, uh, uh friendship was endangered or would would be endangered um by this and this is something that um germany couldn't really afford especially if all the allies um say yeah we need you to accept these new borders and give those lands to to the polish um, especially because in those lands all the german people um, who once lived in these lands where after the second world war they were pushed to to germany they um, had to search red uh, refugee in germany um, which was a brutal process um, which is sometimes by some compared to the uh, March of Tears with the Native Americans in North America, um, which were also forced to leave their homes to, to go to reservoirs. The same happened to the Germans in all these former German zones uh, and the Sudetenland and all the other zones where Germans lived within the um, Soviet Union and I think also uh, in parts of Western Europe um they they were forced to leave and they um were and 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 i mean forced they they were not asked to leave they were not said you have to leave they were uh brutally 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 forced um with many 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 of those even um dying and um so for for that reason there was not really a cultural claim you could make on those territories um, apart from that it were historically German but you you had no um, German uh, majorities there um, you almost had no German minorities there and um, so it would be very very hard to claim that back um, and like I said as far as I know um, Helmut Kohl did never openly um, claim those territories back um, for a reunification. World War II, Helmut Kohl wanted all these lands returned. But it might be wrong. They were Germans, West Germany had never given up its claim to these territories, and they should be returned to Germany as well. Now, it is one thing to ask for two countries to become one. It is a whole other matter to demand Soviet and Polish territory just to be handed over after 45 years. And the four powers basically told Helmut Kohl, it's either East Germany or nothing. In the end, Kohl relented. He agreed that the newly formed Germany would relinquish all claims to Polish and Soviet territory in exchange for German reunification. Okay, I will, I will, I will look that up because I did not know of that. Um, um, and I will put it in the info text box and um might even pause the video on, on if, if the text gets um too long because if everything i just said was bullshit i i, I want you to know so um like i said i am not an expert and uh, i will always 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 make sure that you know i am not an expert and you will always know because i will make mistakes and this would be a huge mistake on my part or not not particularly a mistake because like i said i don't know of such thing of of such claim by helmut kohl himself and um 
Uh, what I know is, because I researched it for another video I, I did previously, um, I guess it was the one on uh, Germany uh, from Geography Now, I actually um, looked up the 2 plus 4 contra treaty and I um, researched when and how West Germany did accept or not accept um, the oder nice linie as the border and during my research um, I came to the impression that as I said before they were reluctant but they did accept it in the end um, even before the reunification process began um, and left their loophole and um, that the allies just put this border as definite in the um, contract to to prevent future claims Germany could make um, because there were no actual real contract for both Germanys um, that would set this border. I, but as I said, um, I will look it up and I will put it in the this uh, not in the description in the info text box right there. Claims to Polish and Soviet territory in exchange for German reunification. And so it was done. The Soviet Union pulled its forces back from East Germany in 1990. The four powers ended their occupation of the two Germanys and a single unified Germany had been born. It was time to party because Germany had been united. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos like this, press the subscribe button. I make new videos every week. Yeah, that's that's a th uh, thumbs up from me. Um, I like the video. It was very uh, informative. Um, as I said, I think at some points uh, things were slightly wrong or left out or um, could be uh, misinterpreted. Mis misinterpreted. You know what I mean. But um, it's it's a very um, interesting. Um, video um, explaining at least the basics on uh, the unification um, of, of Germany. Um, I, I was expecting before I, I, uh, I did not see this video beforehand and I was expecting that they will talk more about the actual division of Germany about the two Germanys but they um, only made it a, sh a short part in the beginning of the video, which in the end is also um, great because um, as you might have uh, um, uh, guessed that the, the whole part between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the actual unification is, is a huge diplomatical effort. It's, is, is, it's a huge um, convincing effort with uh, many many things that I didn't know because as I said I was one year old at that time and when we tackle the German unification in school um, at least in, 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 in my school in Hamburg um, it is very one-sided in terms of yeah West Germany was good East Germany was bad so it is only natural that they would uh, join together and that everyone uh, would be happy about it. So all these uh, diplomatic shenanigans in the, the background will not be tackled and, and also not that uh, there would be um, voices against the unification um, which will not be not tackled but like yeah okay there is this contract and um, everyone was happy afterwards and um, contrary to popular belief the uh, 2 plus 4 vertrag or the 2 plus 4 contract or the blah 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 regarding the future state of, of Germany something uh, like the official title is, is, is a very long title um, is seen as the actual peace treaty the final peace treaty after World War II um, there are still voices inside of Germany, especially from the right corner of things that claim that Germany is still at war, that there is no peace treaty and we don't have a constitution because we have a Grundgesetz, which is a basic law and not a constitution. And uh, we are still under um, American rule and uh, things like that. Like 
those conspiracy theories who sometimes get even pretty loud. There are even people um, who claim that we still live in, 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 in an empire because the empire was never dissolved properly and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but those are conspiracy um, theorists. And like I said, there are also still people who want to um, break apart from Germany again and East Germany and have their old East Germany back. Um, part of this is called Ostalgia, which is nostalgia and Eastern, the German word for Eastern, uh, combined in one word, which means that there is um, right now and in the last 10 years, a huge um, interest in, in Eastern Eastern German culture from the GDR uh, by those from the West and by those from the East uh, there is like nostalgia for for the for East Germany like things they remember and that were great and that they want to have back and um, some of those people um, say okay then let's have it back. Let's let's divide Germany again and let's have our um, own separate country with all our Spreewald Gurken and um, all our um, Ampelmännchen uh, back and and be prosperous and happy and and in in the planned um, economy and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, but. Uh, those are a minority and there are also people who want to make Bavaria its own state again and this is what you have when you have a federal state you have um, states who have at some time or some people in those states have some um, derive for um, independency like you also have with the states in Great Britain with the uh, Scots uh, actually thinking about leaving Great Britain and you have it in the US where you mean secession wars, uh, civil war, uh, you know what I mean. So yeah, that was the video. You find the link to the original video in the description. And I uh, would be happy if you leave a thumbs up, if you leave a like, if you leave a subscription uh, or a thumbs down if you don't uh, like it and um, leave comments and, and uh, join the discussion and uh, would even more be happy if you uh, leave feedback if you think that i talk too much too little uh, the videos are too long too slow um, too too short and um, yeah and, and if you uh, if you watch my other videos um, you will see a video every second day here um, if i if i manage to do uh, that and uh, the next video will be uh, will be about another part of my heritage um, which will be my now uh, home which will be uh, a video about the Hanseatic League so stay tuned for that and uh, goodbye